probably the most important discussion when it comes to picking stocks. You've all heard people talk about this is a good company, that is a bad company. Um, what does that really mean? Do you get different qualities of businesses? Intuitively and logically, we know we do. Some, and just on extreme examples, some businesses fail and some businesses succeed. So tech, obviously the ones that succeed must be better quality businesses. But what is this quality thing and how do we use it to pick stocks? No, sorry, Simon, didn't click. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so the agenda re relatively uh, quickly is we're looking at the theory. What is quality? And why is quality important? Um, just going into the logic, and, and this is a very intuitive section. Like I said, we know that there's good companies, and we know that there's bad companies. Um, why is that important? And then once we're done with the theory, we'll touch on practice. It's all good and well in theory, but can you actually execute this in practice? Is there a definitive and quantitatively robust measure and approach that we can say this company via this we prove is better than that company? Um, and because theory and practice, once again, is useful, can we actually use this in the stock market? Does the theory and practice hold up in reality? Are there case studies? Are there companies like this? Um, and what are the next set of companies going forward? So we'll, we'll go into some company examples, both uh, ones, historical ones, and ones uh, like I hold in my portfolio in the Small Cap Fund Health for Wealth, um, and uh, how collective these, these come together to make very good portfolios. And then we'll just touch on uh, a, question, uh, a summary and question. So relatively simple agenda this evening. Can we go to the next slide? Thanks very much. So the theory. Now, there's good economies and there's bad economies, and there's good markets and bad markets. Uh, what is very, very interesting is uh, when you start to separate them and say, even in bad economies, the economy doesn't disappear. There's still companies that operate. And there's uh, companies that trade all the way through the bad, uh, bad economies and bad times into the good times. Um, and what are those companies? Why are they important? Well, first of all, obviously, you don't lose all your money on that, on, on, on that company. It doesn't go bankrupt. And second of all, that company, when it earns its way out the cycle and gets to the good times, all the marginal and low-quality companies have gone bankrupt, and it's actually probably picked up market share. It's better positioned, and it has first mover and first, uh, first arrival, let's call it, advantage when, when the economy picks up. Um, so really, in the reason quality is important is that in the bad economies and in the bad markets, quality companies tend to survive. In some cases, they actually even grow. They actually even do quite well. But let's not get too excited. Let's phrase it this way, that in the bad times, quality companies survive, whereas in the bad times, the junk or marginal companies struggle and more than likely, in a lot of cases, actually go under. Um, think about a contracting market. Right, You're in a certain market, in a certain economy, and it contracts by, let's call it 10%. That doesn't necessarily mean that every single company in that market feels a 10% contraction. Market share isn't shared equally and isn't felt equally. So within a contracting market, what you tend to find is that the companies that really offer services and products of extreme value to the consumer or extreme quality or uh, have good barriers to entry and really strong management teams and good models, et cetera, et cetera, and all the things that make them quality companies, don't feel the brunt of that market contraction. It's more the marginal companies. Um, who get wiped out by market contractions. Uh, if not, uh, at worst, then definitely struggle. So I think it was Warren Buffett who said that, just to summarize what really happens in bad economies and bad markets is that when the tide goes out, we get to see you swimming naked. Uh, and those, those are the companies that struggle. Then let's flip it, flip it to the other side of the coin. Uh, in good economies and good markets, it's not about surviving. Everything is booming. There's lots and lots of money going around. There's lots of disposable income. Everyone is feeling confident. Everyone is buying and shopping and investing and trading and doing all sorts of things. So the market is growing. Good quality companies were there first. At the start of a boom, there's often very few marginal companies left. 
So the good companies start, feel the early stages of, of, of a growing economy. They're also uh, growing markets. They also tend to be, be better positioned because a product or a service that is really well positioned and of extreme value, um, value doesn't mean cheap, by the way. Value means uh, that the, the consumer or the end user or whoever's using this, uh, this business for whatever reason is getting a lot of value out of it and it's a very valuable good or product or service. But just a product that's good in bad times doesn't necessarily suddenly become bad in good times, it's still going to be good. Um, but what happens in good economies is junk and marginal companies, because there's so much money going around and people are so confident, they suddenly start to pop up and they gain, they, because view it as an expansion in capacity or expansion in demand, the expansion in supply might not be there from the, from the surviving companies. So the marginal companies pop up to satisfy this uh, superfluous and expanded uh, demand. So really going on with, uh, let's call it our, our seaside metaphors, whereas in bad times, uh, when the tide goes out, we get to see you swimming naked. In good times, a rising tide lifts all ships. Doesn't matter if you have a good ship or a bad ship, you, you'll probably do all right. But quality companies, like I said, will earn their way through, will be better positioned and probably tend to grow on a case-by-case -case basis, but tend to actually grow faster during these times. So in summary, if you actually view this in a stock market context, quality companies tend to have more upside and less downside. The ultimate downside is the company you invested in goes bankrupt. And then you lose everything. And that's what true downside is. Down, uh, whereas a good quality company trading through a bad time could drop 10, 20, 30, 50%, but it's still there for the good times where it goes up 10,000, 5,000, 10, uh, you know, 100,000%. So in summary, quality is very, very important from a long-term investor's perspective in the stock market because better quality companies have more upside and less downside. If, if you start the uh, financially savvy, this is something we call the sharp ratio. When you have an excess of, of, of upside versus your downside, that is actually a bet that's weighted in your, uh, in, in your favor. That's something that's quite attractive. Can we go to the next slide? So now we know why quality is important. More upside and less downside. That's an attractive risk equation. What actually is quality? It's all nice to talk about good companies and bad companies, but uh, how do you find them? How do you define them? How do you know what they are? Um, a quality company, and uh, this is actually based on quite a lot of academic research. You can find it scattered across a lot of papers. The latest paper was actually published, and it's a really, really nice summary. I think I tweeted it today. If you go to my uh, Twitter profile, you'll find, find a link to, to the document there. But um, it, the, the ac academic study points to something that is very logical. It's easy to understand. A good quality business is more profitable tends to grow faster and is more stable than its peers. And what I mean by peers is its peers and its competitors in the market offering similar services or products um, in a similar economy and, and, and the like. So that's incredibly intuitive. We know business is all about profit. Investing in the stock market, we know we want growth. And stability is we want the company to stay around. We don't want uh, a lot of risk. Uh, in this business. We want to minimize the risk as far as possible. So that makes a good business. What makes a good quality stock? Well, a stock is just a fractional ownership in a business. So, but there's one variable that you have to add onto this. You want a more profitable, faster growing, more stable business, but you don't want to pay too much for it. So the only context and, uh, and let's call it additional characteristic from a stock market perspective that you're looking for a good quality stock is look at the valuation. And that's the final starting point. When I'm, when I'm researching companies, valuation is the last thing I look at. The first thing I look at is the business. Is it a good business? Does it meet all these characteristics? And then start to consider whether I'm, I'm, I'm overpaying for it, underpaying for it, or paying fair, fair value for it. So. In summary, what is quality? Quality is simple. It's highly profitable, fast-growing, safe, and undervalued makes, makes a perfect stock pick in a high-quality business. It's really the holy grail of investing. Um, that's good. So we've got a theory. We know why quality is important. 
we now know what quality is, um, do these things actually exist? Can we jump to the next slide? So in practice, ne sorry Simon, next slide as well. Oh, there we go, there we go. So do these stocks actually exist and how do we find them? I'll show you later that they do exist, they are out there. Um, there's some very good case studies, historical ones, and there's some stocks that we hold in our portfolio that I think exhibit these signs now and over time, I hope to be proven right. Um, but before we even get there, we've got to be able to measure it in a objective, not subjective way. You don't walk out of a meeting with a CEO and a management team and go, gosh, it's such a good business because he's such a nice guy. I just get a good feeling. That might be important. If he gives you a bad feeling and you think he's a very dodgy CEO, that's, that's a, a, probably a bad sign. But you, but you also want, to some degree, you want a slightly, thanks for that clicking forward. Ah, oh, it's not clicking backwards. <laughs> Okay. Ah, yeah, there we go. There we go. Thanks. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so you want an objective way to measure this so that you can imagine you're a scientist. You can stand up and say with numbers and statistics, I can prove this company is better than that company. So the starting point in, in finance is we have things called financial ratios. It may sound complicated to some of you. It's really, really simple. A ratio is simply at its core, it's two numbers compared to each other be it one number divided by another number or one number, uh, it's, it's really two numbers compared to each other. And what's nice about financial ratios in the stock market is that they're comparable with this company versus that company and this company versus its own history. So you can compare it versus peers, you can compare it versus itself. Peers is important to compare quality, and versus itself is important to dictate trends to see if this company is going up or down or improving or deteriorating. And you could do that because we have this nifty, if not slightly irritating thing called IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. It's a standardized set of rules for accounting for business transactions and businesses. Um, it's accounting. That's why accounting is important, so that we get financial data that is comparable across industries, across companies, and across histories. So we can use that data to build financial ratios, which are simple to calculate. In fact, a lot of these financial ratios are actually published. You don't even need to calculate them for yourselves. Um, and they're nice and quantifiable and objective. So using the quality characteristics of profitability, growth, and stability, and you, pegging them to financial ratios, my preferred uh, methods or characteristics of quality in the stock market, which are very, very simple to calculate, very transparent and comparable across histories and peer groups, is for profitability is the return on equity. It's the, net pro uh, it's the profit generated divided by the equity uh, invested. Uh, if you look at it this way, it is net profit for a year divided by the average shareholder equity that generated that profit. Uh, if that's complicated, view a business as generating income and the return on equity is like the interest rate you, uh, uh, you get when you invest. Not in the share, in, in, in the business. So for profitability, we get return on equity. Basically, how profitable is this business? What return is it generating? Then for growth, we get growth in earnings. That's not a mind-blowing figure. It's earnings this year divided by earnings last year. How is this business growing? There's different measures for earnings. I'm not going to get complicated on that. You know, you can look at HIPS, you can look at bottom line, you can look at EBITDA, but it's growth in earnings. How fast is the profits in this company growing? And then stability, this one might be a, a little bit more abstract to understand. What makes a business stable? Generally speaking, a lot of characteristics, but probably the strongest one is their capital structure. How much debt? have they brought, and debt injects risk. How much debt are they using to fund this business? Um, the more debt, intuitively we know from our, our personal lives, the more debt you have, the more at risk you are. It's the same in business. So a measure of stability is net debt to equity. Uh, it is the debt on the balance sheet less the cash divided by the shareholder equity. We see for every one rand that a shareholder is funding this business with, what, how many cents 
are, are the banks and various other debt providers providing to this business, um, i.e. how risky and how stable is this business. There are me other measures of, of stability, and this is a slightly more uh, difficult characteristic, but for ease of simplicity and in in introduction here to, the, to quantifying the measuring quality, uh, let's just stick to debt to equity. Um, so if any of you guys have read anything I've written or uh, attended any other like um, presentations I've spoken about, especially in the small and mid-cap space, uh, you'll know that I, I define management as one of the pillars, the four pillars of fundamentals. Um, you notice this comment and this discussion on what makes a quality business, a good business, better than another business. I haven't mentioned management. Um, and it looks like an inconsistency. But in reality, a really, really good management team over time will run a really, really good business. And that business, how do you record uh, a really, really good business? Well, it's more profitable, it grows faster, and it's more stable than its peers. So ultimately, a really, really good management team will actually be measured by their results being the financial performance of the company. You can't measure this on the outset, but you can measure this over time. Think about it this way. Um, if it's a really, really, really great business uh, uh, um, and a really, really, really great management team, why over, say, a 10 to 20 year period does the business eventually go bankrupt and it makes losses and all? Well, it probably wasn't a good management team. It probably wasn't a good business. The, the facts and, and the subjective nature of judging people are on conflict there. So. We, our assumption in measuring management here is, is that management itself is measured by the profitability, growth, and stability ultimately in the business because that's what we're looking for. That's how they're trying to run it, and that's how it should come out in the accounting numbers and the financial performance of the company. So sorry, can we skip to the next slide? Um, <coughs> Final thing before I go on and go into some case studies and, and uh, hopefully the presentation gets a little bit more colorful, is if we're going to use financial ratios, we, we should understand the limitations and the risks thereof. And there's pros and cons. Financial ratios can be historic or they can be forward-looking, using forecasts and the like. Historic ratios are safe because they're factual, but they've happened. And what happens in the future may, may not have anything to do with the past. The business may be changing. Um, the future is always relevant in the stock market. But the moment you use forecast ratios, well, there's an element of forecast risk. The future you envision may not turn up. So there's natural limitations to these ratios. And then a final note, be careful of historical bi biases. Um, if you're using historical ratios, understand, especially if you're using long-term averages, understand that long-term averages can change because of uh, cyclical nature or seasonal natures or just quite simply systemic changes in the environment. If you used the 250,000 years of human civilization as your long-term average, while well, we've spent most of the time living in caves without electricity and without any of these wonderful things around us, and you assume mean reversion, we'd be going back there. Um, so you need to understand technolo technology, people, civilizations, things change. Sometimes historical averages aren't relevant. Uh, another thing that makes historical financial ratios very dangerous is fraud. The numbers are wrong. You can't rely on them. Enron's a very good example. There's all sorts of other complexities. Um, like, uh, like I like to say, the pure mean reversion of all you're doing is relying on the past to predict the future uh, is really a, a lazy man's safety blanket. I heard someone else say really, really uh, well that if all we needed in the stock market was the past to predict the future and everything worked on mean reversion, well, the richest people in the world would be statisticians, and they're not. So it doesn't work that way. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So we've looked on... Why quality is important. Companies are more upside uh, uh, and less downside. We know what the characteristics of, of quality are, is that uh, their pro uh, uh, business is more profitable, faster growing, and more stable than its peers. We know how to measure that. Return on equity, um, there's net debt to equity, and then there's the growth rate of a company. Very intuitive stuff that is quantifiable and subjective. Um, uh, do these things happen in real life? So what I've got is the next three case studies are retrospective. 
And we can all look like geniuses in retrospect, but this is just simply to prove that ultimate aims, these things do play out. Better, better quality businesses survive and grow, and better, worse quality businesses, well, in these cases, some of these cases actually go bankrupt, in other cases, wind down and delist and disappear. Um, so this one is Capitec, an African bank. Now, we both know them as unsecured lenders. Um, we both uh, are familiar with their brands. What really happened in, in an extreme summary, because that would be a whole presentation unto its own, in what really happened in African Bank's case was where Capitec went into retail banking. African Bank bought into furniture as, as really a distribution system for its credit extension, then mispriced a lot of its credit, underprovided. Uh, the cracks started to show because it had no retail arm, it was reliant on the debt market for funding. And ultimately that dried up and people got worried. And then the liquidity mismatch started imploding. And that's when the Reserve Bank had to step in to stabilize the ship because it is a bank and we have to protect our banking system. So that's the story. That's the narrative. This graph on the right hand side, first of all, for the next six slides, this graph is uniform. Even if in one or two ratios it doesn't quite agree, it is uniform so that it is comparable and you can go home and recalculate this. I pulled all these ratios from Bloomberg and in whereas the net debt to equities is a snapshot in the latest, uh, latest reporting period because there's a point in time, the return on equity and the, uh, and the sales, the growth in sales that I use as a proxy for growth. And like I said, there's lots of different proxies for growth. This one is just easier and serves our purpose for now. But I use five-year long-term averages so that we can strip out volatility. We can strip out other things just so that it serves as a slightly more robust platform to prove, uh, well, to prove my point. Uh, and in African Bank and Capitex case, we can see, remember, stability. African Bank had not just more debt than Capitec, a lot more debt than Capitec. Capitec, when you, when you take into account the retail funding, uh, was actually sitting on a largely cash position. African, that's why that net to debt to equity is negative because it's not debt, it's actually cash. Uh, African bank at massive amounts. That, that chart stops at uh, like 100. If you go all the way up, I mean, it starts hitting the ceiling here. Um, so, First of all, first characteristic, stability. We can see that Capitec, by a very simple measure of net debt to equity, was more stable and safer than African Bank. Then in terms of long-term average return on equity, the profitability of the business, well, Capitec is way more profitable than African Bank. And then five-year average growth in sales, once again, you can see Capitec is growing, was growing a lot faster than African Bank. So on every single metric, stability, profitability, and growth, Capitec was superior to African Bank. That doesn't mean that when you find these ratios and they all fit perfectly like this, that the one that is inferior is going to go bankrupt. But this one serves, our, 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 serves my point quite well. So the long-term averages are quite clear. Capitec is a superior business. Can we jump one slide forward? Some of you guys might or might not remember Sanyati. Unfortunately, I do. Um, both of these, Sanyati, WBHO, most of you guys will know. Sanyati and WBHO were very relatively, and they wouldn't like me phrasing in this way, but they were relatively homogenous heavy construction groups. You, tend, you go out and tender, you build big buildings and big structures and build infrastructure, and you've got teams that do that. Um, relatively homogenous uh, like, uh, construction groups. Sanyati's uh, collapse and it ultimately went bankrupt um, was triggered by an interesting chain of events. Um, building up in, a, in the construction boom uh, leading up to 2010 and a year or two afterwards, I think, Simon, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this happened 2012, around about there. So it was about two years. They kicked the bucket down the road two years after the floor fell out in the construction industry. But they managed to get a lot of work. Uh, the problem was they didn't really, get, didn't really manage to get paid for it. Um, so they, they managed to grow their, what I call the IFRA sales, the accounting sales. They're doing all this work, frenetic hive of activity, rolling out, I think it was roads in the free state and things like that, doing all sorts of exciting stuff. But it's accounting sales. If you don't get paid in cash, that builds up on your balance sheet as debtors. And ultimately, a business survives or dies via cash. Um, 
And one of their major debtors did not pay on time. That ultimately led to a cash crunch, whereas on paper, they had a lot of assets. On paper, they were relatively profitable. When it came to the bank account, they were bankrupt. And the creditors came and closed them down, and uh, Sanyati disappeared off uh, the JSC. So let's go have a look at the ratios, check if it stacks up. The net debt to equity, we can see that Sanyati had more debt than WBHO. Remember, once again, net debt to equity ratio, WBHO has a negative one there. That means it doesn't actually have net debt. It has net cash. And this is a particularly interesting point. You, If you're investing in cyclical industries, construction, uh, mining, you want businesses that don't have debt. Because those industries are big downturns, dramatic downturns. And companies that have debt are, are ticking time bombs because they have to service that debt. It doesn't matter what their profitability is. They have to service it. Um, so most of the construction industry actually runs on net cash. They're relatively big cash piles on their balance sheets. So they, they can trade out and survive these bad times. You can see here, Sonyati didn't. It had debt. Five-year average return on equity, WBHO miles more profitable than Sonyati. Um, growth in, once again, sales, IFRA sales, accounting sales, Sanyati looks superior. Like I said, these are unadulterated, unmanipulated stats pulled directly off Bloomberg. Um, if I were to change that ratio to percentage growth and cash flow from operations, suddenly Sanyati would probably be negative and WBHO would, be not, would probably have roughly about the same 15% growth um, because sales that don't ultimately become cash or, or actually you're working for free, uh, and there's no point to them. So two out of three ratios, Sonyati is inferior to WBHO. The WBHO looks like a better quality business. The moment you understand the eccentricities uh, of the other stat, well, uh, WBHO once again stands out head and shoulders over Sonyati. Um, and we know how the story plays out. WBHO is still listed. Hasn't done fantastically, but like I said, high quality businesses can still trade down and contract over tough markets. It doesn't mean that they're going to carry on growing in all cases. Sanyati, though, is no longer with us. Right? It's that simple. Can we go to the next slide? Then my last retrospective example is, you notice the first example is in finance and banking. Second example is in construction. This example is in technology. So what I'm trying to do is not just pick three good examples that we all know and can understand are fairly simple and intuitive, show you that they're from different industries. The logic in business, is, uh, uh, the powers of economics transcend industries. They, uh, they, they are true no matter what industry you're in. Uh, and if anyone tells you otherwise, turn around and run the other way. Um, so both of these, Gajima and EOH, once again, much like Sanyate and WHO, are fairly homogenous RCT service groups. They've got a hardware component that they provide at relatively low margin. They've got a software component that they provide at slightly higher margin, but the vast majority of their revenue and their profits comes from services. The implementation thereof, the maintenance thereof, the managed services, the call-outs, the outsourcing of data center infrastructure, the like, the service part. Um, and neither of them would like me comparing them and saying that they are homogenous ICT service companies, but they largely are. Um, the difference is Gajima built its business predominantly out of public sector IT spend. Uh, I think it was at one stage, at the peak of it, it was earning over half of its revenue from the public sector. View it this way. And does it sound like this is a risky proposition or not? When you're a big business and over half of your revenue is coming from one client, that's a bit of a risky position to be in. And then, because it's one client that is a big spender, there are big contracts that come out. So not just one client is half of your revenue, but large contracts form large parts of that. So one of their large contracts was the Who Am I Online contract. I think it was the Department of Home Affairs that they ran it with. Massive, multi-year contract. Just the size and scale of it is mind-blowing. Um, and ultimately, it became a failure for them. Uh, for, for reasons we're not going to go into, and I'm not even sure if there's reasons we'll ever know and all the true facts, but it was a failure. Um, th there was 
it, it ground to a halt. There was all sorts of discussions. There's all sorts of revenue that they'd accounted for in delivering, never been paid, and got questions on and how to impair. Obviously, all of that hurt the profit, uh, the cash flows, the profit, and quite importantly in the service industry, the reputation. Services is a most unique product to consume. You only know the quality of a service after you've consumed it. So for a prospective a new client, the only way you can judge a service before you consume it and have to pay for it is based on reputation. So this big public contract blowout damaged their reputation. Um, that already created quite a bottleneck in winning new clients and growing the business. Um, there was many rounds of rights issues, and finally it was delisted by its major shareholder. So this business is still in existence. But a what I would call a relatively defensive delisting is, in my mind, a, quite a failed listed business. Um, they may still reincarnate and relist and do well. I'm not saying uh, you can write them off entirely but they're no longer with, with us in the listed space. EOH, over this entire period, do not have any of those problems. In fact, EOH listed during, I think it was the dot-com bubble, and it's just carried on growing ever since. Like I said, even in the biggest blowouts and the biggest contractions in markets, good companies can carry on surviving. So let's look at the ratios. Stability, net debt to equity, Gajima. Miles more geared, miles more geared than the EOH. Bang, risky. Five-year average return on equity, the profitability. Kojima doesn't even break a profit on the five-year average return on equity. Uh, EOH, on the other hand, is very comfortably profitable. And then average, average sales growth. Remember, I go back to this comment on reputation uh, in the service industry. If you ever analyze service businesses, remember that. Reputational risk is key. Um, Kojima actually doesn't even have growth in the five-year period. It's been contracting over that period, whereas EOH is just shooting the lights out and growing. And every single metric, EOH is a better quality business than Kojima is. Um, so those are our retrospective analyses of companies, just to show you across industries, across companies, using very basic ratios, analyzing quality factors of profitability, growth, and stability, we can get a relatively clear picture that these things hold up. The next three companies we hold in the Alpha Wealth Prime Small and Mid Cap Fund. So I'm talking my book, but on the flip side of the coin, I have skin in the game. So you can view it either way you want. But these companies, a core theme in the way we approach a small and mid cap market, because we feel it's very risky, and it is risky, is the starting point is quality. If it isn't a good business, we don't look further. It does not matter what price you get it at, because we're exposing our unit holders to too much risk of downside if the business fails. So our starting point is quality. And you'll see I do touch very briefly on valuation, but the theme of this um, presentation and arguably our, our fund that we run is quality. Um, so I'm going to focus on those. Can we go to the next slide? The first company is Adapt RT Holdings. Adapt RT is an RCT service firm. Um, Un, well, sorry, an R is, is an application firm where Gajima and EOH are RCT service firms. So they've, their biggest asset and their biggest expense is payroll and human capital, which are really the same thing. Um, that also means that in the absence of infrastructure and reputation, that asset can walk out the door or that asset can turn around and say, I'm more valuable, pay me more. The application environment Otherwise known to laymen like me and you and everyone else uh, who's not in the tech sector, which is actually just software, which we all interact with every flipping day of the year and uh, every moment of our lives, is um, your core asset is actually what you built. It's your software or your application. Once you built it, selling it to one client or selling it to one million clients costs no more or less, give or take. Um, it's very, very scalable. And what's interesting about the sales process and the cash model in this business is clients tend to pay up front. Think about your window license fees. You don't pay at the end of the year or end of the month if you're a business and you've got window licenses after you've used their product. You pay right up front so that you can get 
that product, that software for, for the next month, year, quarter, or however long. Um, you pay upfront for an installation and software, not afterwards. Um, whereas, how does a software company remunerate its employees at the end of the month? So you've actually got a negative working capital cycle here. Whatever profits, whereas Sanyati, for periods, declared really good profits, but it had no cash flows. Adapt IT is an interesting case where it, de it declares very good profits, but its cash flows are often more than its profits because it's getting paid up front and it's paying its expenses in arrears. So without going into what the applications and the various software that they sell is, because that's a whole other topic, it is in a fast-growing niche, in a fast-growing sector. Um, it has, because of the software licenses and the maintenance agreements and the like, it has strong annuity cash flows. Its software is globally scalable. Perhaps not at the level of Microsoft, but in its niches, it has some very good products. Um, and how does all of this translate to um, remember our core tenants, our core characteristics of quality, of profitability, growth, and stability? So in this chart, what's quite nice about Adapt IT is that I can compare it to EOH and Gajima. Now we know though, that these numbers prove that EOH is better quality than Gajima. How does, it, how does the Adapt RT stack up to these guys? Well, first of all, um, you can see Adapt RT has less debt than even EOH and actually sits on net cash. Then on a five-year rolling average return on equity, it's actually more profitable than EOH, which is a better quality a company than Kojima. So, and then, uh, so it's growing slightly, slightly lower, slightly less fast than uh, than EOH. But let's let's call it roughly two out of three characteristics. Oh, but at least it's growing compared to Kojima. So two out of three characteristics are superior to EOH, and we can kind of round the one and call it uh, on par. So Kojima is not just, what, in my opinion, a better a better business model where you're not um, de reliant on your personnel per se, you actually have intellectual property that you own that can't walk out the door. Um, and it has a negative working capital cycle. But it's actually on, on, on the basic, basic characteristics of quality, it stacks up two out of three times is better than EOH. Um, what's interesting is when you look at the growth, you can look at a macro level, it should grow across the sector at about 10%, market share gains of about 5%, it can add another 5, 15% in acquisitions, sustainable growth path of about 20 to 30% year in year. Because it's a small player, it can grow at this in the next 10 or 20 years before it starts to become big and starts to become constrained to its markets. So there's a long runway of growth. So let's call it 20 to 30% year in year growth, but you're paying a 21 times multiple for it. And that multiple is based on accounting profits, not cash flows. The moment you work out that price earnings based on, 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 on let's call it uh, cash flows, profitable cash flows, that price earnings is quite a bit lower. So on a valuation perspective, it ticks the box of, the, of quality business that I'm, re I'm quite comfortable we are not overpaying for. In fact, I think we're underpaying for. And that's why I like Adapt RT. Shall we go to the next one, please, Simon? Thanks. So the next example, once again, um, WBH are much better quality than Sanyati. Well, this is quite convenient for this example because Culgra M3 also operates in the construction space, albeit it has a radically different business model. Sanyati and WBH are relatively homogenous heavy construction businesses. Culgra M3 has, has a risk-based approach to providing housing in South Africa. Uh, housing is a relatively infinite demand in South Africa, let's be honest. Um, they are, be, they are market leaders in this, in this approach in providing housing in South Africa. Uh, and they've, they've got a long track record and big barriers to entry in doing this because they have multiple products spread all over the way. They trade all the way through the spectrum and different housing products and, and, and the like. Um, and for, with a 19 billion project pipeline, they've only got a market cap. This I, I typed before uh, we've had an interesting week or two in the market. This market cap's down, down to about 2 billion now. Um, small caps are always going to be volatile. It doesn't matter. And uh, 19 billion project pipeline, 2 billion market cap. And that 19 billion project pipeline are just the things we know about. They've been working on other projects 
for for uh, two three years that that they're de-risking and when they when they're comfortable enough they'll add it to the project pipeline and we will know so there's no blue there's what i'm saying is there's blue sky beyond this 19 billion project pipeline um, but how does it measure up on the stats so net debt to equity it looks terrible that's the, that's one that's quite awkward and like i said i'm not going to manipulate these stats pull them directly out of bloomberg they are unedited it looks terrible until you realize that as a property developer, it owns underlying properties. Properties tend to attach with a fair amount of debt. And as you're working your way through a very big uh, a housing project of literally thousands of houses, I think the biggest one has got about 5,000 houses, and there's one that they're scaling up that might even have 15,000 houses where it becomes uh, like, a, well, it's not going to underline, but big projects. Um, strip out the debt relating to to this underlying property and the like and that debt to equity ratio comes down quite a bit but that explained away let's not give that one to them let's say that is a black mark against them it's a lot of debt on the business how does their return stack up well they're more profitable than wbho which is way more profitable than sanyati so um and then moving to the other quality characteristic of sales, they, they, their sales are not even their growth rate in sales are not even comparable in the smallest way to any of the other guys. They even beat the growth rate of sales in Sunyati, where the guys were trading on faith, not cash flows. Um, so let's be harsh in cold growth. Let's give it two out of three marks versus WBHO. So one of the major players, one of the best quality construction companies on the JSE. Colgro beats it in two out of three quality characteristics. And then when you look at the growth rate of the pipeline they can roll out, add other initiatives in Blue Sky with a, with a sustainable growth rate in, let's call it, uh, in the next five to 10 to 20 years of 20 to 40%, you're only paying, I think it's about a 15 times price earnings now. So you're not paying that much for this. And it's a very good quality company. Um, so those two were in the construction space. Oh, sorry, that one was in the construction space, very comparable to our retrospective examples that we read here on Sanyati. Um, Adapt.T was in a tech space, we can compare it to EOH. A final one uh, is Santova. Now, Santova doesn't have, really have a direct comparative on the JSC. It's a very unique business. So it doesn't tie into the Capitec and African Bank one. There isn't always perfect sym symmetry in, in presentations. So what I've done to build these uh, comparatives on the right is I've pulled all the average, uh, uh, the global average of all of the listed companies all across the world that are, that are in the same space as Santova and built built an average to compare it with. You just need to understand that these businesses are in some cases hundreds of times bigger than, San, uh, than Santova. Um, so one could argue there's returns to scale, much more successful, much more refined business models, but I think Santova is better. And let me show you why. Actually, first let me explain what Santova is. It's a non-asset-based supply chain manager. Best way to explain that without getting too technical is on the one side you've got uh, clients that have very complicated logistics needs. They are importing and exporting goods. They need the stuff moved around and warehoused and cleared and forwarded and dropped over there and move it to that distribution center and drop it off for those stores and those customers. That's a really big task. And then on the other side, you've got logistics providers. You've got Grinrod with shipping. You've got Value Group that uh, does truck rentals and all sorts. Of, you've got warehouses. You've got clearers and forwarders. And that's just in South Africa. Then you've got all the ones across the world. Um, um, then right in the middle is really where uh, Santova plays. Santova is best viewed as a business process outsourcing company. It's kind of like an outsourcing company with a, a really robust and scalable platform that they built called Oscar that plugs into the client side and outsources and manages all the logistics guys to make it maximize efficiency, make sure everything is exactly where the client wants it to be. Millions and millions and millions of transactions, tracking everything, a massive amount of data flowing, um, handling all the clearing and forwarding, handling all the logistics, handling all the complications, and even in the South African context, handling 
the, uh, the, the payment of import duties, uh, import VAT and the like that you, only, that you then have to claim back from the clients, handling even the regulation thereof. Um, and it just flows and ticks along. And the way they replicate this business model is they open up trade routes and they bring in new clients and then they plug into more systems. Um, that's why it's not just a supply chain manager, it's a non-asset-based supply chain manager. Best way to view it, logistics outsourcing intermediary. Um, so, uh, and it's quite interesting because they've been quite successful. Uh, 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 Glenn Gerber runs this. He's been quite successful opening up trade routes. At this point, they're actually earning half their profits from outside of South Africa. So for a very small company, they're starting actually to become a rand hedge. Um, but how does this stack up versus the much bigger companies, the UTRs of this world, the expedators, the uh, Kuhnen Nachel, if I'm pronouncing that right. There's a whole hand, uh, handle of, of really big international global players that are really good. On the debt to equity side, Sanyati looks terrible once again. Um, that's a symptom of the fact that in South Africa, we've got very u unique regulations. You have to collect import duties and VAT, um, I believe, on behalf of clients, and you can only claim it back. So you actually have a bridging facility that runs. Um, as they grow, uh, well, you charge them interest on it, uh, and, and they blue chip clients, and you, you actually get, get a very nice interest stream from it. But because it almost that function almost works like a, a kind of mini bank, um, as they expand internationally, you'll see that debt to equity ratio come down because nowhere else in the world do they have this regulation. So you can generate very, very strong free cash flows from the operations. But that ratio explained, and that's why the rest of the ones have it much lower because they don't really operate in South Africa as much. The weight of their operations lies elsewhere, which doesn't have this regulations. But once again, let's give that a black mark. How does uh, its five year average return on equity for a small company that's growing fast? is actually superior to its global peers. It is actually more profitable and much, much, much bigger, much, much, much more scaled businesses. Um, and five-year average growth rate is actually growing faster. So on a very, very harsh view, um, Centova, two out of three points in its name versus not just the local market, global competitors, hundreds of times bigger than Centova. Um, this, uh, this is a business I believe is going to do really, really great things. Uh, and then if you look at the valuation, like I said, you know, international growth, uh, trade growing at about 7%, market share growing at about 7%. You can open up new trade routes and geographies, be it organic or acquisitive uh, approaches. And you should be growing at this quite 20 to 30% year on year actually for probably quite a long time because international trade is massive and, and Santova is small compared to that. And you're paying 11 times the multiple for a business like this. That is not bad in my opinion. So those are the three stocks, like I said, that we hold. So talking our book, um, but we think they not just good businesses, they demonstrate extremely good uh, characteristics, the quality characteristics, but we're actually not not paying too much for them. And in many cases, I think we're underpaying for them. Uh, Simon, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, what do you get when you build a portfolio of just companies selected in this approach? This is a slide that doesn't really pop up in our fact sheets. We don't broadcast a lot, but I think it's a slide that's quite interesting from a fund perspective. Uh, and you could do the same in your personal capacities, building, applying this methodology of picking quality companies is you can actually go and measure your portfolio versus the whole market. And you could see that um, uh, our small cap fund has less debt than the market. It, on average, is more profitable at a business level. We're not talking stocks, we're talking business level. It's more profitable than the market, and actually it's growing faster than the market. So we are less risky, more profitable, and faster growing at a portfolio perspective than the market, which can never hurt. Uh, if you make sure the final characteristic is that you don't overpay for these businesses. So you protect yourself from that. Um, so selecting exceptional stocks really uh, should, in theory, arrive at an exceptional portfolio worth in the long-term exceptional returns. So going over to the next slide, please, Simon. Um, summary and questions. Really, um, quality companies have more upside and less downside than marginal and junky companies. And the way we measure that quantitatively and, and objectively is you can measure it with profitability, which is return on equity, growth, 
uh, uh, earnings growth, and these examples are used sales growth, or it was easier to pull from Bloomberg. Um, but it, it various metrics of growth and stability. I like net debt to equity. There are other various arguments for different measures of stability and always compare them versus their peers. So it's a very powerful combination of selecting good quality companies and considering their valuations, make sure you don't overpay for them. Really, the holy grail of investing, in my opinion, is buy the most profitable, fastest growing, safest company and underpay for it. That's what stock picking is. So I'd like to open for questions. I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I saw recently you commented on Taste Holdings. Can you comment on Taste and your thoughts on telling us the platinum? Sure, that, that's fairly diverse picks over there. So, so the question for the guys online was around Taste Holdings and Pellinghurst. So Taste Holdings, we actually hold in the fund. Uh, my perspective is, let me give you a couple of stats. Well, first of all, I like the valuation. I like a back the management team. They're young, they're energetic. Uh, they, they're very invested in their own stock. They're doing the right things. They pull a good management team around them to execute the dominoes rollout. And I can, I, I can talk around that. There are once of costs, and it will be a slightly longer uh, growth trajectory. So you're buying it with a bit of weight towards future earnings. Um, but let me throw a couple stats around that are quite interesting. Domino's in America to build their online ordering system for pizza, which by the way is in the top five highest volume e-commerce um, uh, providers in the world. It's right up there. If you just count volumes of transactions going on this platform, it is right up there with PayPal and I think Amazon, and there might be a, uh, there's obviously a couple of others. So it's a real seriously a serious platform, world like a the top of the world sort of thing. And Domino's in America spent uh, 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 I might be a little wrong on the numbers, but they spent about 500 million US dollars building just that app. That's half the market cap of famous brands, and Taste is getting that for free, I think, in about a week's time, maybe two. Um, it's very hard, whereas Debonairs is entrenched. They've got a good store footprint, um, and their current market leaders. Over time, we're backing Domino's rollout because they quite simply have bigger infrastructure. Um, and there's what's interesting is they rolled it out in, uh, I think it's 60, 70, 80 countries around the world. So we have a lot of case studies about how this rollout works. What are the success ratios? What are the key things to look at? Um, and what are the ultimate valuations of those companies and the profitabilities of the master franchise holders and other geographies? And in my opinion, at this point, taste share price is trading at a point where I'm buying dominoes in the food segment, give or take it about fair value. And everyone forgets about NWJ and Arthur Kaplan. I'm getting that free. Um, and that's assuming a reasonable rollout in dominoes. I think they might, they might surprise to the upside in that. And NWJ and Arthur Kaplan is, like, is basically you're getting like a free mini for Sheenies. Uh, so I like taste. Ticks, ticks a lot of those boxes. But if you to buy taste, you've got to back the dominoes rollout. Moving on to Pellinghurst, I don't like the platinum sector. Definitely. Okay. Uh, the question for the guys online was, well, before we move on to Pellinghurst, what about the fish and chip business and taste holdings? Uh, definitely in the short term, what you've seen, like a fish and chip is, is a very interesting low LSM model where they have a fixed royalty structure, not a sliding royalty structure. So each store is very, very profitable, extremely cheap capex to roll out. And their focus is to provide you as much food as possible for about 30 rand. That's the market they're going for. And what because they, they're predominantly exposed to fish proteins, uh, in the background we've had some fish shortages and fish prices have gone up. So it's become very challenging to provide that. And there's, there are other alternatives. So that business, yeah, currently not doing very well. Um, but it is a good model. It's in a good space. You know, uh, fish, the fish soft commodity prices rise and they fall. And, and it's all sorts of random variables there. There will be another day when fish is dirt cheap and the fish and chip will be pumping. So I don't think in the in the short term there may be some drag from Fish and Chipco. In the long term, they're in the right space. That part of the market, the Domino's part of the LSM, is brand conscious. Um, the 
the fish and chip co part of the LSM is not brand conscious. They're price conscious or price sensitive. Um, and that's the right model for that space. So I'm not at all concerned about that. Going, going to Pellinghurst, uh, one, I do not like the platinum sector. I do not like exposure there. Um, uh, there are surpluses in the world. Recycling is getting more efficient. Everyone forgets about that. Recycling of platinum, when it's in a catalytic converter, it is not used up. You can recycle that. And particularly as price per, the spot price in platinum over the next couple of years perhaps starts to rally from a shortage in production, well, they just recycle more. Um, there's, it just makes it more and more viable. So the platinum side, I, I simply don't like. I don't like anything in the platinum sector. Um, then there's also, uh, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Fabergé that exists within Pellinghurst. It may be a good business. I don't like their disclosure on that. I can't tell a lot of metrics and I can't judge what's happening in Pellinghurst. So as, as a, an investor and not a gambler, when I don't know sufficient amount of detail about a business, even if it may be good, I prefer not to be there. Just because if there's a blowout, it's very hard to justify why you're in it in the first place. Because you say, well, I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh, gosh, I didn't know that either. They go, well, what did you do? Why did you buy it? <laughs> uh, so so um, uh, generally speaking, I don't like Pellinghurst at all. Keith, some questions coming online, one from Vessel, one from Bo Vessel, saying simply, how do you then value? Everything's great. We've worked out the company. How do you get the price that you pay? And Bo's question is, is PE involved or is it more complicated? And stop hating on my famous brand. That was from me. <laughs> um, so, so really, uh, those questions are centered around valuation. And um, for ease of reference, because the, the theme of this presentation and a limited amount of time was I wanted to get across why quality is important, how you measure it, and actually prove that it works. Um, you know, statistically, uh, mathematically, financial ratios is there. Like, quality is a very important thing. So when I, when I went into the, like, a couple of my stock picks, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on valuations. I could do a whole other presentation on each one of those companies with all the valuations. My approach to valuations is, is you know, pick a couple uh, like uh, predominant methodologies that suit the company. So different companies will have different valuation methodologies, and uh, some of them are more important than others. But you want to uh, view it as a toolkit, and why why approach it with only one one tool? Why not approach it with a whole lot of different tools? Value it a whole lot of different ways, and hopefully all those valuations point to the fact that you're underpaying for it, and actually it's worth a, worth way more than you're paying for it. Um, so it's a it's, it's a great investment. Um, so so those ones I just like to use price earnings, and I do use it. Price earnings is not irrelevant, but it has its limitations. But I used it for ease of simplicity because I don't want to detract from the main theme of this uh, presentation. Sorry, there's a question in the back there. Hi, hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, one stock that sort of keeps popping up is PSG Group. Um, obviously, Cap, uh, Captic Bank is part of them, as well as PSG Consulting. Do you have any comment on PSG Group? And then the second question and last one that I have is, with blue chip uh, stocks, you know, this is sort of a long-term investment, but with these uh, medium or, or, or medium company stocks, where, so to speak, what do we do there? Do we keep an eye on them yearly, sick, uh, biannually? What would be the best way forward? Okay, so, so the question's in two parts. First of all, PSG is um, the holding company group. It's really two things. It's the sum of parts of the underlying. So the best way to analyze that is to analyze the underlyings. Go and value Capitec. Go and value Zeta, which itself has underlying, so it becomes more complicated. Uh, go and value PSG, Consult, and Cura, and the like. Stick them all together and get a sense for your own valuation. And then it's the management team. So PSG itself actually draws management fees from these companies. So it actually makes a profit as a standalone entity. You can value that. And then you have to consider what these guys will do in the future. Uh, the Mutan uh, and, and, and his crew have actually proven an extremely good track record. Um, you could back worse managers than that. My advice would be if you're approaching PSG, buy it at a discount to its summer parts, and then you're getting its management free. That's because that's, uh, it's very hard to uh, value management like that. We value them on deals they haven't done that they don't even know they're going to do. So if you can at least buy it for less than its underlying is worth, um, well, you're getting a free option on management. That would be my approach. Um, then, sorry, what is the second question? The second question was, 
The second question was um, oh, with ah, long-term yeah. stocks and obviously yeah. the medium cap. Yeah, so how often do I revisit it? Well, it's very simple. It's my job. I revisit it on a daily daily basis. Uh, but but for, for uh, the purposes of you guys, companies result twice, uh, present their results twice a year. At bare minimum, read those results, stack up the ratios, and consider whether the fundamentals and the quality of the business is deteriorating, improving, or staying the same. If it's a good quality business and the, and the quality is staying the same, that's not a problem. But if it's, if it's starting to deteriorate, debt is building up, their profitability is going down, growth is slowing down, um, I would start to reconsider my investment uh, proposition there. Businesses, good quality businesses can become bad quality businesses and vice versa. So at a bare minimum, I would revisit um, your investment twice a year with, with the latest set of results.